Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. Curtindo um podcast, né? Sabe o que você também vai curtir? Saber que o melhor flip de todos os tempos chegou. O novo Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 6, com flex cam, que tem zoom automático e faz selfies de 50 megapixels. E com bateria estendida para nunca te deixar na mão. Vá a uma loja ou saiba mais em samsung.com.br. Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 6. Galaxy AI chegou. All right, before we get going, I gotta thank some new Patreon subscribers. We got Rebecca Ray, Barry Leadham, Vivia Bo, and Joanna Lane. I hope you guys are enjoying the back catalog of Patreon episodes. I do thank you greatly for the donation. Another huge thank you goes out to Lindsay for putting this episode together for me. And of course, ABC 2020 for the 911 and voicemail audio. And then we also got justiceforfaith.com, WRAL.com, and of course, a whole slew of other articles and ABC, NBC, Daily Tar Heel, stuff like that. So I will be reading some reviews at the end of this episode as well. But for now, on with the show. This podcast contains adult content. Some of the themes or topics may include information on murder, kidnapping, Torture, dismemberment. Maybe some demonic content. With information on positions. And paranormal activity. This podcast will also include explicit. Horrible and foul. Socially unacceptable. Totally uninhibited. Adult themes language. So if you're easily offended. If you're easily triggered. Then I highly suggest... You turn this off now, and if not, just keep in mind... Parental discretion is advised. On the morning of September 7, 2012, Chapel Hill police entered the apartment on Old Durham Road to find a blood-soaked bedroom. It was brutal. Investigators began piecing this case together by retracing the final hours of Faith Hedgepeth. For the most part, Chapel Hill police have played things close to the vest when it comes to releasing information. There is no sign of forced entry. 911, where is your emergency? I just want to see my apartment and my friends. I just want to be unconscious. All right, before we get going, I do have to credit one huge source that I forgot at the beginning. It would be the case file. There are pages that, eh, they're somewhat redacted, but uh, I will post a link for them in the episode description so you can go through and read them yourself. I will warn you, they are pretty graphic. You know, they don't hold back, so uh, just so you know that, they will be in the episode notes, and that was a huge, huge part of the research and information, so... Faith Hedgepeth was born on September 26, 1992 to Roland and Connie Hedgepeth. She grew up in Hollister, North Carolina, which is part of the Halawasaponi Native American tribe's traditional territory. Faith was a late-life surprise baby with an 18-year-old older sister, which is one of the reasons her parents named her Faith. Her father was quoted as saying, She was a gift, you know. Because she came to us at a low point in my life, she kept me going. She was my faith. Connie says of their daughter, It was a rough time for our family, but faith came at a time that gave us all hope. She came at a time when I needed her the most, to keep focused, to keep working and keep my family together. Unfortunately, only a couple months after Faith was born, her parents divorced, When they split, her mother gained majority of custody and her father moved four hours away. Faith's older sister, Rolanda, also lived with her and their mother. And being so much older, she was basically a second mother and helped raise Faith. Rolanda said of her sister, I helped take care of her from the beginning. 
Everywhere we went, people thought she was my child, and she was. I felt like she was my child. Faith Hedgepeth truly was a loved individual. Just scroll through her Facebook and you'll see the comments of people who really enjoyed hanging out with her. She was an honor student in high school. She worked so hard she was awarded a Gates Millennium Scholarship to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. With this scholarship, she was on track to be the first person in her family to graduate from college, and her family was extremely proud of her. She was uh, going with a medical major, hoping to one day fulfill her dreams of helping children as a pediatrician. Her first two years at the university went well, and then she took the spring semester of 2012 off. She remained in the area during this time. She had moved into an off-campus apartment with her friend Karina Rosario and Karina's boyfriend, Eric Jones. She had known Karina since uh, the beginning of her freshman year. And while Faith was living there, Karina broke up with Eric and he moved out that summer. No one ever really had anything bad to say about Faith, and that's probably why it came as such a shock to everybody when on September 7th, 2012 at 11 a.m., the Chapel Hill Police Department received this 911 call. And this 911 call is like sectioned off in little sections. You can't actually get the full audio from what I could find. It might be out there, but this is just a couple clips from it. 911, where is your emergency? I just walked into my apartment and my friend just like to be unconscious. When you touch me, how does she feel? She's so cold. She's in my bedroom. Now, on the 911 call, you can hear one of Faith's best friends and roommate, Karina Lynn Rosario, speaking to the dispatcher. She found Faith's body when she returned home, and according to the police record, she advised that she found Faith's body on the floor. But police noted that her body was on the bed face up. The top half of her body was hanging off the bed over a pool of blood. Her shirt was pulled up over her head and she was naked from the waist down. There was blood splattered on the closet and a bloody tampon was lying beside her on the bed. They also found a handwritten note on a white paper bag from the fast food restaurant Time Out on the bed as well. In the initial police report stated, it said, quote, I am a jealous bitch. But later it was revealed it actually said, quote, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. Since the bag had no blood on it, the police believe it was placed there after the murder. It was written in all block letters and handwriting analysis cannot determine if it was written by a man or a woman. So what happened leading up to the discovery? Obviously, one of the first parts of the investigation was finding out if anyone knew or had an idea of what happened to her, starting with her parents. The last time Connie had seen Faith was on September 2nd, when she and Karina drove to her mother's house to celebrate her birthday early. She had also called her mother once after that. Connie said of this event, quote, we were just hanging out, enjoying time with the family. I had no idea my world was about to turn upside down. On Tuesday, my birthday, Faith called me, wished me happy birthday, and that was it. That was the last time I spoke to my baby girl. The last time her father spoke to Faith was on Wednesday, September 5th. She texted him telling him she had planned on joining UNC's chapter of the Native American Alpha Pi Omega. Her father, Roland, said, It was like she always knew the right time to text me. She asked, Dad, what's wrong? And I told her what was going on, and she told me to just have faith. So on the night before her body was found, which would be Thursday, September 6th, around 5.45 to 6 p.m., Faith attended a rush event for Alpha Pi Omega, and after that went to Davis Library with Karina to study for a paper Faith was writing about the history of her tribe. While at the library, this was when Faith was texting with her father, which put them there around 8.30 to 9 p.m. After the library, they went back to her apartment on Old Chapel Hill Road in Durham, supposedly to get ready for a night out. 
uh, just after midnight, they left again. This is confirmed with security footage showing them arriving at a popular nightclub called The Thrill. The club is now closed, but it was a popular spot for the college kids because it allowed patrons under the drinking age to enter for, you know, dancing and hanging out, stuff like that. Karina told police that later she felt sick to her stomach and had decided to go home. Faith apparently decided to go with her because the camera footage shows them both leaving together at 2.06 a.m. But they were not actually together. Like, Karina walks out first, and she looks very animated. She's waving her arms around while she's talking. And about 10 seconds behind that, Faith is walking out with a male. Now, according to a neighbor, she heard them arrive home by about 3 a.m. Records show around that same time, Faith's Facebook was accessed. The neighbor who lived below the two said she heard a few loud thumping noises, which she described as bags being dropped or even furniture being overturned, something like that. Then on September 7th at 3.40 a.m., a text was sent from Faith's phone to a former boyfriend named Brandon Edwards. He was actually a former boyfriend of both the girls, more recently to Karina. Now, although at the time they were supposedly just friends, the text read, Hey B, can you come over here please? Rosario needs you more. Aha, uh -huh, you know, please let her know you care. Three minutes later, a second text was sent that only said, Than. Police believe the word than was meant as a correction to the aha uh -huh in the first text. So if you take the text with the correction, it would have said, Hey B, can you come over here please? Rosario needs you more than you know. Please let her know you care. At 4.16 a.m., a text was sent back from Brandon to Faith that said, Who is this? At the same time these texts were being sent, records indicate that Karina was trying to call Brandon but with no answer. She had called him four times at 3.44 a.m., 3.52 a.m., 3.55 a.m. and 4.14 a.m. There was no return call from him, yet uh, he texted Faith's phone back at 4.16 a.m. After Karina couldn't get through to him, she called Jordan McCrary. It's not said exactly what their relationship was, but that she had a type of relationship with him. At 4.25, he picked her up. When she left, she did not lock the front door to the apartment, and Karina says that when she left, Faith had not come out of her bedroom and she assumed she was sleeping. Jordan drove Karina to 103 West Longview Street in Chapel Hill to see Jacob Beatley, who was more than likely a romantic interest of Karina's. She allegedly stayed at this location until mid-morning. So later that same day, around 10.30 a.m., Karina was trying to find a ride back home. At first, she attempted to call Faith, but Faith did not answer. After not being able to get a hold of Faith, she called another friend by the name of Marisol Rangel, who did answer and came to pick her up. She took her back to her apartment, where they walked in to find Faith's body. From the start, police kept very tight lips about everything involving the case, okay? Everything was sealed by court order, and they did not reveal many details to the media. As time went on, more and more details were released. Lucky for us, it has been quite a while since the, this happened, so we do have access to most of these things. And like I had mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I will put a link to some information on justiceforfaith.com and to the case file in the episode notes. So during the initial search, they seized a lot of items, including bedding, a bloody Bacardi bottle, a remote control, a purple HTC cell phone, pillows, undergarments, Riesling bottle, swabbings, tank top, IBM laptop, pens, note cards, key to the apartment, wallet of the victim, paperwork from the bedroom, paperwork from the closet, bathroom items, and a flat iron. And then on September 10th, they also went back and they took jean shorts, underwear, a white tank top, and sandals. 
Even later in October, they received permission to seize Faith and Karina's laptops. Now, through a sexual assault kit performed on Faith, the police collected semen, which provided a DNA profile. It matched male DNA that was also found on the bag and pen. The investigators believe this is the DNA of the killer. The autopsy revealed the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, which the police believe was caused by the bloody Bacardi bottle that was found at the apartment. From the start, Karina's ex-boyfriend was a main suspect. Eric and Karina's relationship was rocky, and it did have some spots of domestic violence in it. After moving out, he attempted to break into the apartment twice, kicking in doors and knocking them off their frames. Karina ended up going to court with Faith driving her to file a restraining order. This did not go unnoticed by Eric. Supposedly, he resented Faith's influence over Karina and once even threatened to kill her if she did not let him get back together with Karina. Now, these incidents obviously did not look good for Eric, all right? So on September 7th, while the police were at the scene, Eric arrived and agreed to go for questioning. After the interview, Eric returned to the crime scene again and walked right up to the police tape. Officers had to remind him that there was a protective order against him, so a few days later he granted access to his cell phone, and during the search, police found a text sent from Eric's phone to a friend and it was the day before the body was found on September 6th. The text was asking for forgiveness for what he was about to do. They also found a tweet sent from Eric's account to a different acquaintance, also asking for forgiveness for what he was about to do. And then, three days later, he changed the banner on his Facebook page to read, Dear Lord, forgive me for all my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. Weird shit, right? So at the time of the murder, Eric lived in the same apartment complex only a few buildings away. When he was approached and asked to give DNA, he originally refused. But then when the police filled out a warrant and were ready to serve him, he decided to comply and willingly handed over a sample of his DNA. Now, unfortunately, even given all the bad things against this guy and all the incriminating coincidences, the DNA was not a match, and the police felt this cleared him. When he was interviewed by a news reporter, he said, From what I knew of her, she was the sweetest person in the world. If you needed her and she could do it, she was there. I'll be honest with you, whoever did this deserves to burn. You know, maybe he had a little bit of guilt. I don't know. Like I said, the whole situation does not make him look very good. But also, after some digging, it was confirmed that in the video surveillance from that uh, club they were at, The Thrill, the night that Faith and Karina were there, Eric was there along with a few other men that they knew. All times of any, now is not the time to overpay for razors at the drugstore. Harry's knows that sometimes it's better to stay inside. That's why they ship directly to you, so you can experience the quality of a Harry shave in just a few days from the convenience of your own home. Personally, I like Harry's, and for those of you who have seen my face, yes, I often do have facial hair, so you're like, why are you endorsing razors, man? Well, faces ain't the only thing you can shave, if you catch my drift. But in all seriousness, I do shave every once in a while, and Harry's does it for me. It's it's a great razor, and the shave gel smells really, really good. <laughs> and uh, you honestly can't beat the prices. You really, really can't. Uh, you can join the 10 million who have tried Harry's, including myself, and you can claim your special trial offer by going to harrys.com slash mysterious. Why on earth would you even want to choose Harry's? Well, because they have quality, durable blades at a fair price. Literally just $2 a blade. They cut out the middleman. They manufacture blades in their German blade factory that's been honing precision blades for a century which means you get incredibly high-quality blades at factory direct prices. 
That and it's super convenient. Blade refills are delivered directly to your door on your schedule, with or without a subscription. Besides that, you have a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know and they'll give you a full refund. And 1% of proceeds are set aside for nonprofit organizations devoted to helping provide access to better health care for men and veterans alike. Listeners of Mysterious Circumstances can redeem their Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash mysterious. And here's what you'll get. A weighted ergonomic handle for a firm grip. Five blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade. Rich lathering shave gel with aloe to keep your skin hydrated, which is super important. Nobody wants razor burn. And a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy to grab on the go. Like I said, all you got to do is go to harrys.com slash mysterious to start shaving better today. Brandon Edwards, as we know, was the ex to both women. The night before Face Last Night Alive, he stayed at their apartment and crashed on the couch. This would be September 5th. On September 6th, he said he woke up around 11 a.m. and left. This is also who Faith texted and Karina called the morning Faith died. It seems weird that he would text Faith back and ask who she was, considering he had a romantic relationship with her in the past, and that he ignored all of Karina's calls, yet he texted Faith's phone. He just stayed the night at their apartment the night before. So why would he be acting like he doesn't know Faith and be ignoring Karina? There is a possibility he didn't have Faith's number, but she did text him Hey B, which sounds like a nickname, as if she had texted and spoke with him many times. It's It's hard to believe he did not know who it was during this text conversation at first. On September 9th, Karina called Brandon for the police and asked him to come in for questioning. He agreed and came in the next morning. The police also searched his car and took four swabs total, but nothing ever came of those. He was at Club Thrill the night Faith was there and admitted to having contact with both girls that night and into the morning but he was omitted through the DNA testing. Another guy named Reginald had exchanged text messages with Faith the night she died, and he was also at Club Thrill. Police really had a hard time catching up with him to speak to him. He had a history of citations and reckless behavior. Uh, When they tried to set up an appointment with him to gather his DNA, they arrived at his apartment and he was not there. They knew what car he drove, and they saw him enter the parking lot and turn around and take off. So they followed him and pulled him over. And when the cops spoke with him, they asked if he did indeed see them and try to run off. And he admitted that he did, and that he doesn't normally cooperate with the police. They asked if he knew Faith, and he said he knew of her. They asked if he would sit down with them, and he said no. So they let him go. He did end up later giving DNA, and this was only due to a court order, and he was omitted through DNA as well. So Jordan, the guy who picked up Karina at 4 a.m., would have known Faith was alone, but he was also excluded because of DNA testing. Now a guy named Jacob, whose apartment Karina was dropped off at by Jordan, claimed he was home the entire night of September 6th and 7th, But later, when police checked a cell tower dump record of that night, they found that his cell phone was close to the crime scene at 4.15 a.m. But as we know, cell phone pings are not the most accurate the majority of the time, and he could have been anywhere nearby, not specifically at her apartment, because cell phone towers don't always work off of the closest tower to the cell phone. They work off the most powerful one or the most open one at that time. He was also at Club Thrill with everyone else, and he had allegedly made threats against family members in the past, but he was also cleared by DNA. But another odd character in the story is Brandon Edwards' roommate. 
His name was never been released anywhere, but he had a history of violence against women. The police did search Brandon's apartment and his car, which was registered under a different Edwards, which we can, you know, assume it might have been his father or something like that. And they never released any further details on whether they found any evidence against the roommate there. He refused to give DNA and he was never served, so he has not been cleared by DNA. In fact, this dude seems to be the only person somewhat close to Faith that was not cleared by DNA. Now, Karina herself was interviewed many, many times, but with a male DNA sample and semen found at the crime scene, it seemed like they were just hoping to get more information from her than them treating her as a suspect. She would not speak to any media after the murder, and she pretty quickly moved away. Now, this could be viewed as suspicious, but personally, I would probably want to distance myself as well, but it does kind of look bad. Now, although nothing can be ruled out, it seems like Karina probably did not kill Faith, but I definitely think she knows more than what she is letting on. Apparently, she and Faith shared quite a few men and overlapped relationships. That could definitely lead to a lot of animosity, possibly jealousy. A lot of people bring up the point that she told Faith she needed to leave the club because she didn't feel well, but then apparently left again after going home and felt well enough to go see a guy. They walked out of the club separately which could be a coincidence, or it could uh, mean they might have been arguing about something. And the fact she left the door unlocked, it feels like an odd thing to do, especially knowing Eric lived close by and had been violent in the past and tried breaking into their apartment. Another weird thing about Karina is that Marisol was with her when she found Faith's body. But she was not there when police arrived, and you cannot hear her on the 911 call. She never refers to any other person being there. She never talks to another person. She never says we in the 911 call. It's always I. Some people believe that it was Marisol that actually called and just gave Karina's name out of fear for whatever reason. But she obviously did not match the DNA, and the police seemed to really believe the DNA was left by the killer. Now, there's another bomb to drop on you. There is a giant piece of evidence that was released way later by police. Faith was notorious for butt-dialing, and the night of her murder, she butt-dialed a friend and left a voicemail. The voicemail is extremely distorted. Uh, something that happens to cell phones when a very loud noise happens is that it goes silent instead of actually outputting sound. It creates pockets of silence that distort the entire recording. And even though it's hard to hear, it is clear there is a dispute going on. There's some kind of argument going on. You can hear female and male voices. You know, I, I think it's impossible to tell how many different people are in the actual recording, though. At one point, you can hear music playing in the background, which has been identified as the T-Pain song called Booty Work. Considering that the neighbor under the girls did not report hearing any loud music, it would seem like the voicemail must have happened while they were at the club. And I'm going to go ahead and play this voicemail for you now. This is just little sections of it, and it is extremely distorted. So, here you go. All right, like I said, very distorted. Now, here's one of the biggest internet arguments about this. The timestamp on the voicemail said it happened at 1.23 a.m., but for whatever reason, every armchair detective out there got it in their heads that the timestamp was wrong, and it actually happened during the murder. 
While it is true that cell phones at the time did glitch and sometimes put the wrong time, it was something that only happened on the actual phone of the person who received the voicemail, not the person who left the voicemail. Police did confirm with the provider of Faith's phone that the call went out at that time and with the provider of the person who received the voicemail. So I have to say it seems pretty airtight that it happened at 1.23 a.m. while they were at the club. The volume of the music is almost the same as the people yelling, so that would have to be, you know, extremely loud music. Now there is a quote-unquote expert from Crime Watch Daily that supposedly made a transcript of the voicemail, but his version seems a little skewed and does not make total sense. I will give you a link in the episode notes to this as well so you can read that transcript. There are so many different theories out there about this case and so many players in this story and so little information. It seems like this should be an easy case to solve and yet the police have never even arrested anyone. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. General opinion on the internet is that Karina did it, or at least was involved somehow. She does seem somewhat suspicious, but if she did do it, why come home and discover the body? Many people think Karina wrote the note left on the fast food wrapper, and that could make sense considering the confusing relationships they both had, but the note is clean, which seems really odd to police. Another thing with the wrapper is that it had to have been left there after the murder, or even possibly written in another room while the murder was going on, or before the murder, or something like that. And if it was the case that it was left there after the murder, that means the person would have had to clean up before they wrote that note. But that person didn't even bother to clean the Bacardi bottle that she was more than likely killed with. Faith also had scratches and bruises all over her. There was definitely a two-sided fight, but the neighbor downstairs only admitted to hearing loud noises once. Could the girls have walked into someone waiting for them? Maybe Eric. Maybe it was actually common practice for them to not leave the door locked, and Eric was there and attacked Faith when they walked in. Maybe Karina was scared and didn't want to go to jail, so she helped Eric by sending the text and writing the note to try to throw police off the trail, or maybe she was in on it and did feel that way about Faith and she helped plan the whole damn thing. She could have been in the argument with Faith at the club in the voicemail. Maybe the argument turned them against each other, and that's why she, uh, you know, faked being sick because she wanted to leave. Now, Karina left North Carolina very soon after the murder and never moved back. Although police have said they are in regular contact with her and she is 100% cooperating with them. I find it hard to believe Karina did it, and the police never broke her, or even suspected her hard enough to name her as a suspect. And they supposedly interviewed her for 8 to 10 hours on that first day. So, personally, I think Karina knows way more than what she is letting on. 
but that's just personal opinion on my behalf. You know, they searched her laptop and phone and found no suspicious texts or messages. And like I said, maybe she knows more than she's letting on, but I really don't think that she did it. I also find it hard to believe that Karina or Eric got someone else to commit this crime for them. There was semen left behind. The murder weapon is believed to be the Bacardi bottle, which was kept in their kitchen. The note was written on a fast food wrapper from their apartment. It was not thought out or planned. It seems like more of a crime of opportunity or like a rage killing or a spur of the moment thing. Who plans to murder someone but shows up expecting to find a weapon there? You know what I mean? It seems like the best and most plausible options would be either Brandon's unnamed roommate, who was known for violence against women, or a random person. Brandon's roommate may have known they were home alone and went over there. Brandon could have called Karina back later and learned Faith was left alone and this roommate could have heard it. It is highly suspicious that he is the only person who has not given DNA, and it is said the police have collected over 800 samples at this point. On that point, though, some people think that DNA means nothing. Sure, they found some semen on her. Police never released if she was for sure raped or sexually assaulted. They didn't even say if the semen was found inside her or just on her or at the scene. But who's to say that she didn't just hook up with somebody from the club that night? Maybe that started an argument between the two girls. But there was also a bloody tampon found next to Faith, which definitely suggests rape or sexual assault. Or if this were consensual sex, I doubt she would remove a tampon and just toss it on the bed. You know what I'm saying? If she was, uh, you know, on her period or menstruating... I don't think she's just going to pull that thing out, just lay it on the bed before she has sex, you know. The police did not find any other DNA, though, and she had blood under her fingernails that matched the semen. So I'd have to say it seems like it's pretty positive to be that killer. It's also not unheard of for a random attacker to just walk around trying doors to find unlocked ones and being apartments so close to the college, I'm pretty sure it's known that a lot of students might be living there. Now, someone could have easily just found Faith asleep in the apartment and attacked her as well. And even though it's unlikely, the note could have had nothing to do with the murder at all. Or even maybe blood somehow didn't hit the note, although the police seem sure that they are somehow connected. Police have a lot more info that they haven't released. They are very tight-lipped to begin with, so I cannot believe they have given up all the clues, which makes sense because they need to keep certain facts to themselves so they know if someone falsely confesses or if someone knows facts, they would not know unless they were there. On September 23rd, 2016, on an episode of ABC News 2020, which is where I got those audio clips from, Chapel Hill Police released an image generated by Parabon Nanolabs, which is a genetic testing company in Reston, Virginia. And the image that they released was of what the suspect who left the semen might look like based purely on the phenotype in his DNA profile. Now, according to the image, the suspect was very strongly Native American and European mixed ancestry or Latin. Most of his genetic markers pointed to Mexican, Colombian ancestry with some other South American and African countries making up the balance. Now, Parabon believed with over 80% confidence that the suspect would have a skin tone in the olive range with very few freckles or none at all, and black hair. And uh, the profile didn't make any predictions as to his height or weight. Now, police have said that this is not a cold case and never has been. Faith's family began a scholarship in her honor named Faith Hedgepeth Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship is offered to help a Native American woman from a North Carolina tribe earn a higher education. They have given out 22 $1,000 scholarships in the years since Faith's murder. 
Faith's mother was quoted as saying, She wanted to help people. That was her dream. Now she's helping women like herself every year. I have peace now because she's with the Lord. But I always say, Lord, whoever played a part in her death, may faith dance on their heart every night and every day, and that every time they close their eyes they think of her, and think of the life they stole from her. We can only hope and pray that one day someone comes forward. The family is offering a $40,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest of the person or persons responsible for Faith's murder. Chapel Hill Police on September 5, 2014 released 299 pages of documents related to their murder investigation into the death of Faith Hedgepeth. Portions of the document are provided they're a little bit redacted to protect the identities of people who have been part of the investigation. And like I said, I will put that link in the episode um, description so you can go check it out and read it for yourself. If anyone has information about Faith's case, contact the Chapel Hill Police Department at 919-614-6363 or Chapel Hill Crime Stoppers at 919 919- Nine four two seven five one five, or you can go to crimestoppers-chcunc.org. And there is your episode for you. It's a pretty sad one, pretty sad one, but very solvable, very solvable. So until next time, I'll see you folks on the flip side. Let's check out some new reviews. Oh, look at this. We got a two star. S. Sullivan 135 has potential. Picks some interesting topics, but sounds like some random high school kid making a podcast. Count the number of times you hear a uh, during the episode. It's up to four in the time that it took me to write this. Well, in the time it took me to say this, I thought about the words, you can go fuck yourself. Exactly fucking two times. Uh, two times. Next one is five stars from Joyce291. Like listening to a friend. Great conversational podcast, not just someone reading off a piece of paper. Well, thank you, Joyce. I do appreciate that. Uh, I guess that goes with the uhs. You know what I mean? Uh, who we got here? Five stars. Lori0307. This podcast is bomb. This podcast provides a wide array of intriguing topics. The level of research Justin puts into this podcast is astounding. His sultry voice paired with his knowledge of true crime, paranormal, and other topics makes me want to climb through my phone and lick his face. (laughs) Well, that is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Oh, who we got here? Uh, Incel85, five stars. I'd give it more if I could. Well, fucking A, thank you. Uh, We got five stars. Michaela Briggs, love it. In my top three. Happy to be in your top ten. Fucking thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Let's see, we got five stars from Nect, 1994. All the topics. I never know what the topic will be, but I know it'll be a good one. Hey, I, I appreciate that, thank you. See, we got five stars, a fix, 1995, not like the others. Love the fact MC does his own thing, not boring script reading with cheesy music. (laughs) Well, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Julian Townsend, five stars, top five, definitely in my top five. Lots of back episodes and always interesting. Well, thank you very much, Julian. I do appreciate that. Let's see what we got here. Oh, the infamous Jetta J. One star. Trash. There's nothing more pathetic than a grown man with an ego problem and the mentality of a 10-year-old child. Tone down the machismo because you're not fooling anyone. Machismo? 
what the fuck ever, Jetta J. Like, literally, I fucking rolled through all the fucking podcasts that you gave one-star reviews to. You're a fucking moron. Here's where you made the mistake. Your ego told you that podcasters like me actually give a fuck what you think. That's the best part about it. And in all honesty, I've met a fuckload of podcasters. A lot of them. And I can tell you right the fuck now, I am one of the most humble ones. Man, trust me, I can fucking name a dozen of them that think they're legitimately fucking famous. Okay? Legitimately think they're fucking famous. So, trust me, I'm a pretty humble motherfucker when it comes down to it. But uh, I think you're trash. And, you know, as the saying goes, don't take criticism from people you wouldn't take advice from. And since you have zero fucking podcasts, you can fucking eat my ass. Alright, what's this one? Five stars, Rachel Lauren Ross. Yes, five stars. First of all, can we all agree that Justin's wife is one lucky bee? <laughs> the voice, though. Second, I want to crack a beer literally every time I turn this on. As a matter of fact, ksh, great stories, amazing storytelling, awesome as fuck guests, never go away, but really, never. Rachel. God damn, Rachel, I tell you what, that was, that was a fucking great review. Um... Yeah, if I had a wife, she would probably not be that lucky, though, because I have put a lot of time, I'd probably be neglectful, you know? I'm, I'm a busy guy, but that's how that goes. Who, who we got here? Five stars, Thick Brickhead, keeping it real. Excellent cast, Justin. Enjoying your candor and diligence with the history aspect on most of your work. Humor is also just enough. Definitely one of my favorites. Well done. Uh, keep up the great work. Thick Brickhead? Fucking cheers to you. I greatly appreciate that. And I think that is pretty much all from the USA. What we got here? We got, uh, holy crap, UK lighting me up. Five stars, Kira Giles. Just what I like. I love the unsolved crime episodes, but when I need a break from that, there's all kinds of other stuff to listen to. Yeah, that's true. I tried. I got lots of uh, different interests, you know. So, thank you. But thank you very much. Next one here. Uh, five stars. Oliver Shearston. Want more? I would love to hear more Western crime figures. Well, I tell you what, if you switch on over to Blood and Dust, Wild West True Crime, one of my other podcasts, uh, we are going to start recording and releasing new episodes starting this month. So, you are in luck. And thank you very much for that review. Next one is uh, Christopher Phillips, five stars. It says, love. I just love the way Justin presents his cases and gets right to the point. And he makes sure to tell you what's rumor and speculation and what's fact. Well, Christopher Phillips, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, what else do we got? Let's try Australia. Nope, none from Australia. Let's check Canada. Five stars. Me H. Chavez. Absolutely loving the historical episodes. Well, I appreciate that. Next, uh, <laughs> this one is five stars. It's uh, Pietro for Pietro, 1993. It says MC Nation, like, and then it's got the, uh, the devil horn emojis, which is badass. Thank you. Man, all right, I think that's about it. I do have one, though, that was sent to me through email. Sorry I'm not very lively today, by the way. I uh, had a long day, and it's pretty late right now, so that's kind of how that goes sometimes. Okay, this one is from Jackie, and it's five stars. And it says, Hi, Justin, I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of months, and I really enjoy it. It's very well done and extremely well researched. You sometimes cuss a bit more than you should, and sometimes you ramble a bit, but when you do, you're showing your passion for the subject. Love the topics and how much work you put into each podcast. A little advice on those one-star reviews. You don't need to defend yourself. <laughs> you may not be everyone's cup of beer, but you've got a very loyal fan base. Uh, let the people who want heavy production go for that. There are more of us who love this show just for what it is. Thank you so much for your passion and your hard work, Jackie. Jackie, thank you very much. And obviously we talked, I emailed you back. 
And uh, next time I'm in New Mexico, I'm sending you an email. Well, I can't say next time. <laughs> if I ever go to New Mexico, I'm going to hit you up because, uh, yeah, we emailed back and forth. And I told you how much I appreciated that email. Even though I don't care if people have iTunes, man. I mean, don't get me wrong. iTunes helps with getting recognized with more people on the platforms, blah, blah, blah. But, dude, just getting emails, people saying, hey, dude, like, fuck the haters. You know, do your thing. We love you. You know, shit like that. It uh, definitely makes up for the bad that uh, comes with being a podcaster. So thank you, everybody who takes time to leave reviews. I appreciate it. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy. Let's be honest. Like, we have needs let's be real and communicating that what you want what you don't want what sets up now this drink is brown because i learned something since i'm older i can't do brown liquor anymore also i noticed since i started on hormone replacement there at hrt in 2015 me and certain liquors don't mix don't mix well i don't know whether and i recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women and that's because men are seen as these leaders as this big alpha male dominant thing dominant being and because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders sometimes they want to be submissive back when i cosplayed a butch queen in south carolina around 2011 I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts.